just a symbolic act. I, I mean, it's no different than knighting a, than, than like, you know, grant, you know, whatever, knighting a knight or whatever. You know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a symbolic act, and it sets individuals apart. It, it imparts spiritual blessings, authority, and power. It's just something that we do. It's, don't get all tied up in that. It's just it's, it's a symbolic act. Jesus often would put hands on people and raise them from the dead, but at the same time, he would say, get up and walk, and they would just get up and walk. It, it kind of like seals the deal. You know, I, there's, I, talk about, I was thinking about this a lot earlier at, 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 my, at my work. At my job, I, 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 sell, I sell, you know, deals, and I make deals with people. And, and this has kind of bit me in the backside a couple times, but rarely do I make people sign on it. We, take, we make that symbolic act of shaking of hands to kind of seal the deal. So it's just, it's a symbolic gesture. Let me impart a blessing on you. Let me pray a healing on you. Let me touch you. It's a symbolic gesture. Now I'm getting ahead of my notes here, but Paul was so filled of the Holy Spirit that the things that Paul touched brought healing to other people. So there, there is some stuff there, but it's a symbolic, it's a symbolic gesture. And I begin to think about this. I believe it was prophet, the prophet Elijah. There was a young boy who died and he said, bring me that boy. And that, and they brought him that boy and, the, and Elijah laid him down on the ground, and he threw himself over Elijah three different times. I also believe that when we reach out and we touch someone, that's a bold move of faith. I think it puts things in motion. We ask you to come to the altar. We ask you to raise your hands because it's just a bold move of faith. I think when Elijah was, sh- was throwing himself over that body and crying out to God, that was a bold move of, move of faith. Dude, I hope to God your God hears your prayer because you look a little bit ridiculous right now. It's just kind of putting faith in motion. Listen, I can stand back here and pray for an anointing and pray for a blessing on you, or I can come up in a bold move of faith and just kind of declare it. So that's what Paul did. He reached out his hands, and he touched them, and he said, listen, I pray that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they begin to speak in tongues. Now, again, I know my people here, but some people don't understand that, and that is just confusing to people. I don't get it, and it doesn't make sense. And here is my absolute best argument I have for that. Well, dude, until you experience it and try it, you don't even know. The thing is, is I am... I am, uh, um, um, I'm honest, I'm truthful, I'm real, I'm genuine. There's nothing fake about me. Ask me a question, I'll tell you the truth. And, and, and I respond to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, Holy Spirit is real. I speak in tongues. I don't always understand it. It doesn't always make sense to me, but it's genuine and it's real. And the Holy, I'm telling you what, man, the Holy Spirit, the, the ability to speak in tongues, it helps us express what's in our spirit, which words cannot express. There's something stirring up inside of me, and I can't really put it into words, but the Holy Spirit comes in and it helps me, remember? He is the helper, and he helps me put into words so I can communicate with my Father in words that other words cannot express. And when people are speaking in tongues, and you only get to that level of proper discipline, but when people begin to speak in tongues, what it also does is it edifies the body. What happens is, and I only know of Tanya, Connie, and I think maybe like one or two more, that they have the ability and they are gifted with the ability to speak and give messages in tongues. My, my Aunt Connie, and then she, she passed away. Now it's Tanya. And isn't it crazy how that worked? We didn't ask for this. We didn't ask for this. And when she speaks in tongues, it's, it's sound. I don't know if that's Tanya, if that's the Holy Spirit, or if it's Connie. You know, I mean, it's, I know it's Connie. Who is? Who's talking right now? But what happens is, is the Holy Spirit begins to work on Tanya, and he says, I've got a message for my congregation. And so when Connie is, or, or Connie, when Tanya is operating under discipline and proper management, not restricting the Holy Spirit, but harnessing its power and being mindful on, hey man, if this is wrong, I'm going to mess up the flow. But she builds on it, and she's disciplined enough. She knows the voice of her father. She knows what's happening. And then she begins to kind of get going, and she gives a message. Now, until somebody can interpret that message, nobody knows what it is because she's speaking and she's speaking in a heavenly language. We don't know what it is. I don't even know if Tanya knows what it is. I think when I speak in tongues, I have an idea of what I'm saying, but I don't know what I'm saying, but I have a feeling of what it is. So all of a sudden, I remember thinking back, back as a kid growing up, I always knew I'd behind, I, would be, I would be behind this microphone. I always knew that I would be a preacher, and I remember saying, you know what, there's going to come a time when people are going to, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to interpret that message like my dad does, but I'm not going to be able to do it. 
I don't know those words. I don't know that jargon. I don't know that language. I don't know if I can ever do this because I don't know how to do what he's doing. Lo and behold, this year, all of a sudden, I have the gift to do that. And it is the craziest thing in the world. And I don't know how to explain it except the fact that every time it happens, in my mind, I'm thinking, is this, uh, are we doing this? I think we're doing this. You know what I mean? Is this really happening? The first time it happened... It's back towards Easter, back around Easter when, when, when Dad was sick in the hospital. And we had a great service before we even started this, 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 this second service. And, and Tiny gave a message, and every single one of us were thinking, who's going to interpret this bad boy? And I remember standing up here in the pulpit, and I'm thinking, who's going to interpret this? And we'll just let this one ride out. And I, my, best, my best way to explain it is all of a sudden it hit me, and my response was this. <laughs> like I got sick. Oh, oh, okay. You know, I mean, really, that's what it is. And I know that's the Holy Spirit. I know He's working through me. When, I, okay, oh, I, I kind of like, get like takes my breath away, and then He begins to give me this interpretation, and my mind is thinking, okay, Brad, what's my next word? I'm like literally, my mind is with me, but what's coming out of my mouth is not what's me. I'm saying words that I naturally wouldn't say. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago when I was given an interpretation, my mind, Brad, wanted to say a word, but a different word came out of me. So, for example, thus saith the Lord. I don't talk like that. That's not me. But there's something coming out of me. And I'm telling you what, for 36 years of my life, I've never been able to do that. But over the last year, I've gotten serious about my calling. I've gotten serious about my relationship with God. I've gotten more disciplined. And what has happened was God looked at himself in three different forms. He looked at his son. He looked at the spirit and he said, listen, do something more in Brad's life. Turn up the heat a little bit. Turn up the power a little bit. Begin to develop what's inside of him. Let him be able able to interpret the tongues so last week something unique happens never never had it happen before this is new to me we're closing the 11 o'clock service and the holy spirit begins to move and it was awesome it was genuine it was real and we had some new people here and i was ner not nervous but of course i'm always mindful on how people are going to respond and and the holy spirit begins to move and tony begins to give a message and i look at my visitors and they're just boohoo and they're just crying like crazy so i knew they they didn't get it but they knew it was genuine well, but before that happened, before that happened, we were closing the service, and I could, I could feel, I could feel what was coming on me, and, and it felt, and it felt like, um, it, it felt like it was an interpretation. But the problem with that was, is there was no message. So I'm feeling this, you know, really, you know, I'm, about, I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna throw up, you know. And so I'm feeling this, I'm thinking, I feel like this is a message, but there's no message from Tanya quite yet. And so I share what's on my heart, I share what's coming up in my spirit, and then afterwards, Tanya gave a message, and I told the congregation, I was like, I believe that that is my message. But I went and I talked to Dad afterwards, we had to go drop some stuff off of the house, I said, Dad, let me explain to you something that happened, that happened today that I never had happened before. I said, I believe that I gave an interpretation for, for tongues that wasn't even given. He said, my son, you prophesied is what that was. He said, when you feel the spirit coming out of you and you got to share something with someone, even there's not a message in tongues, he said, that's prophecy. Go back and read the text that I just read. Paul said he went up to them and he put his hands on them and they prayed for them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They, they began to speak in tongues and the Bible says, and they begin to prophesy. They begin to prophesy. Prophecy is not fortune telling. The word prophecy means to set forth a matter. Set forth the matter. They weren't, they weren't telling, they were fortune telling. They weren't just making random things up. They were, they, what they were doing was they were setting forth a matter. When the Holy Spirit came on these men, they began to set forth matters in their life. And instead of life dictating them, they begin to dictate life. Most of us spend our time responding to life and setting, instead of setting forth matters into life. We wake up and we say, hey, what's life going to do to me today? And how am I going to respond? No, no. When you get the Holy Spirit up inside of you, it gives you the ability to prophesy. It gives you the ability to set forth matters. I wake up in the morning and I say, how am I going to run my day today? How am I going to set forth matters today? I declare that my marriage will be restored. I declare financial blessings in my life. I declare that my children will be protected. I set forth these matters. Why, Brad? by himself cannot do it, but Brad with the power of God can. 
Amen. Amen. It gives you the ability to prophesy, to set forth matters. Jump to verse 11. Verse 11. So God, so God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Paul, Paul was an average dude, but God began to do extraordinary things through Paul. Why? Because Paul spent three or so years being disciplined, and after he did that, they gave him power, and they ratcheted it up. And the Bible says that so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that he had touched, that he just simply touched, were taken to the sick, and, and their illness was cured, and the evil spirits left them. The power wasn't in the handkerchiefs. The power wasn't in the aprons. The power was in Paul. But the power was so thick. The power was so genuine. The power was so mighty that everything he touched became powerful. I'm telling you, that's the type of power I want. That's the type of power I want you to have. That when you walk into your workplace tomorrow, you, you walk in and people say, oh my goodness, there's something different about you. And just every time you're around me, I can sense you. I'm, I'm inspired by you. Everything that you touch is turns to gold. There's something about you. When I sit in front of you, you, you motivate me and you encourage me. And I leave better off. After talking to you, there's something about you. We can have that. Paul had that. But what makes that possible is power. And the only thing that makes that possible is the Holy Spirit. So like, I like this. Go to verse 13. Verse 13. So some Jews, there were some Jews that were going around and they were driving out evil spirits. Listen to this. And they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. Listen to what he said. They would go up to people and they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches about, I command you to come out. They, they, they would go around to people and say, so here you, got, you, have, you have Jews who don't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're attracted to his power. And so they're going around and they're praying for people who are demon possessed. And they say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom he knows. We don't know Jesus, but we cast you out in the name of Jesus who he knows. We ain't got no power. But apparently this guy's got some power. And he knows the name that's above every other name. He knows the name Jesus. And apparently there's power in that name. So we cast you out in that guy's name. Look what happened. Verse 15. And one day, from doing that, what did it say? The evil spirits answered them. Time out. Pause. Commercial break. If you're running around and being dumb, and I'm looking at my crowd, and I don't really have that today. But if you're running around playing, making bad decisions, making bad choices, playing with things you shouldn't be doing, you know, getting involved, having the conversations, looking at things, reading things, I'm telling you, there's going to come a time when evil is going to answer you back. I call you out in the name of Jesus, the one who he knows. Then all of a sudden, they answered him back. And listen to what they said. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But I don't even know who you are. The question for you today, does hell know who you are? Jesus, I know him because there's power that resides on him. Paul, I know him too because he knows the name of Jesus. But I don't know who you are. Oh, my goodness. You better believe that I feel that today hell knows who I am. I am a threat to him. The same power that rested on Jesus now rests on me. Does hell know who you are. And if you, Jesus, I know that's a bad dude. Paul, that's a bad, that's a bad man, a jammer. You, I don't even know who you are. Verse 16. The evil spirits jumped off of that man and beat those dudes up. Sent him off running, bloody and naked. The fact of the matter is, we're talking about Paul. We're talking about Paul, and we're talking about how powerful Paul was. But the thing is, is yeah, that may be true, but Paul was a horrible preacher. Later on in the book of Acts, there's a story. Later on in the book of Acts, Paul is preaching in a third-story building. He's talking to people. And his preaching is so blah that there's a young man, young whatever, young man sitting in the third, sitting in the window frame, and, um, and he falls asleep because Paul preaching was blah, just so lame. There's no fire behind it. And he falls asleep, and he falls from the third window to the ground, and he hits the ground, and he dies. Go back and read it in Acts. 
So although Paul was not good, was not a good enough preacher to keep people awake, he was able to walk down the stairs, lay his hands on the young man, and raise him back from the dead. So he wasn't charismatic enough as a preacher to keep people from falling asleep, but he was so powerful to make dead people come back to life. It is the anointing. It is the Holy Spirit. It's the anointing. And Paul is an example of how everybody is is not anointed to do everything, but everybody is anointed to do something. Paul, you're not anointed to preach, but you're anointed enough to raise dead people back to life. Stop preaching and start raising people back to life. Everybody isn't anointed to do everything, but everybody's anointed to do something. Find out what you're anointed to do and do it. And do it. Don't, from now on, from this moment on, don't sit in this church and not do something. I'm serious. Not for my gain, but for your gain. For your gain. I want to rain on the seeds in their life. I want to turn up their power, but they ain't even disciplined enough to open a door for somebody. They're not even disciplined enough to pick up trash off the floor. They're not even disciplined enough to shake a hand. I can't use that. Get up and get your anointed. Your, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your income level. It doesn't matter anything. You are anointed to do something. Find out what that is and do it. And do it. My goodness. Even, I, even in Isaiah, they're talking about Jesus. There was nothing special about Jesus to look at. He was not attractive. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 53, verse 2, it says nothing in his appearance would make us desire him. So why did people desire Jesus? They were drawn to his power. They weren't drawn to, they weren't drawn to Jesus the man. They were drawn to Jesus the Christ. He is not even good looking. We're not after him because he's, you know, whatever, you know, you know, whatever, 6'5 and, you know, broad shoulder. I mean, no, no, well, no, the dude's ugly. But there's something about his power. The Bible is full of people that are just common, normal people that God uses for his purpose and for his glory. Often we think that if we don't have a certain size bank account, if we don't have a certain education, or if, like, if our last name isn't the right name, then all of a sudden we will live a mediocre life forever. But you're failing to realize that if what I just said refers to you, then you are a prime candidate, prime candidate to be used by God. Why? Because God gets great glory when he reaches into the never, the never should have, the never could have land and pulls something common out of it and does something uncommon with it. Amen. That deserves a greater amen. God gets glory when he reaches into the never should have, never could have land and pulls out something that's common and does something uncommon with it. Um, that's you, right? I'm in the never should have land. I'm in the never could have land. Reach in and pull this common bread out and use it for an uncommon reason. In 1 Corinthians, it says, not many wise people, not many mighty people, not many noble people are called. Why aren't they called? Because God knows if he uses the mighty, the wise, and the noble, and God uses it for his purpose and for his glory, they will take all the credit. But in Isaiah 42, God says, I will not yield my glory to somebody else. That is my glory. And to ensure that I get all the glory, I will use the common people to do uncommon things. Amen, hallelujah, everybody does this. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about you, you bunch of uncommons. No, you bunch of commons. I'm talking about you. You are the common. There's nothing special about you. Perfect, you are a prime candidate to be used by God. God should never use me, perfect. God could never use me, perfect. God hasn't used me, perfect. God would never use me, perfect. I'm not, I'm not tall enough, perfect. I'm not skinny enough, perfect. Perfect. I'm not fast enough. Perfect. I'm not smart enough. Perfect. I don't, I'm not pretty. Perfect. I don't smell good. Perfect. That's who God uses. Look at David and Goliath. Look at David and Goliath. I would imagine if you go back and you examine the stone that David used and compared it to other stones, it's a stone. Even his sling is a sling. It's a child's toy. It's a child's toy, but yet David was able to take the stone and the sling and kill the Philistine champion. 
Why? Because there's something that happens when God takes the common and puts an anointing on it and puts power on it. Then all of a sudden, the common things become uncommon results. Even David himself. I got, I got through this a lot faster. Even David himself. Listen to the story. David himself is super, super common. So David's about, let me back up. Jesus goes to Samuel, and he tells Samuel, he said, listen, man. He said, I want you to go to Jesse's house. He said, I want you to go to Jesse's house. And he said, I want you to go find the next king. I want you to go find the next king. So Jesse, so, I'm, so Samuel shows up to Jesse's house. Jesse knows he's coming. He said, I'm here to find the next king. So Jesse goes and he brings his boys out to stand in front to pass by Samuel. He brings the first boy and he comes in and he passes by Samuel. He passes by Samuel and Samuel looks at him. And apparently he's good looking and he's tall. He's good looking and he's tall. And Samuel says, this clearly is the guy. You know, here the guy looks like royalty. And the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, that ain't him. He said, other people look at the outer appearance. I don't. He said, I look on what's inside. I don't look at, you, you, think, he's, you think he's fit to be a king because he's got a nice, a nice smile and blue eyes, his hair is calm and he's tall and he looks masculine. I don't look at that. I'm about, that, that right there, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for the common. He's uncommon. People don't look like that. <laughs> I'm looking for the common. So move on. So, so Jesse brings the next boy. Good looking boy. Certainly this is going to be the king. And the Lord said, I ain't him either. Son after son after son, seven. Seven times his sons pass in front of, of Samuel. And, and every time Samuel, like, this has got to be it, right? I mean, we're on the fifth kid. This has got to be it. And the Lord said, that ain't him. That ain't him. Nope, that ain't him. Keep on moving on. So they finally get to the end of the line. And, and, and Samuel says to Jesse, okay, I'm here to anoint a king. You got any other kids running around here somewhere? And Jesse says, well, yeah, but certainly God doesn't want him. He's super duper common. Matter of fact, I didn't even bring him in because I knew you wouldn't pick him. He's actually out in the field right now tending the sheep. But trust me, you don't want him because he's just average. He doesn't look at my, are you sure you don't want this one right here? And Samuel says, go get that boy. So they go out. They go out and they bring in David. And the Bible says when David walked in, God told Samuel, stand up and anoint that boy. Stand up and anoint that common. Why? Because I'm about to use the common to do something uncommon with it. I know right now he's average. And I know right now that there's nothing special on him. But, but in a moment, I'm going to have you take this oil and you're going to anoint him. And when, and go back and read it. The Bible says when he anointed him with the oil, that he was overcome with power. He took the common and gave it power. God says, you look on the outside appearance. I'm looking on the inside of the appearance. I'm looking to the heart. I want to know who amongst you right now are staying, is staying devoted to the cause. You all came in waiting for me to show up to bless you. I want to know who's outside still working, still, still staying true to what needs to be done. Who's still obedient. I, who's that? Where's that guy at? Who's the person that's still keeping their hand to the, the plot? You don't want him. He's outside working. Yeah, I want him. I like that about him. There's something different about him. Go, go get him. Go get him. Go get him. He was so uncommon. Think about this. He was so uncommon that even his dad, knowing that a prophet was going to come to anoint one of his kids to be king, even his daddy said, David, stay outside. Daddy, stay outside. But no, dad, but the king's coming. But my mate, he ain't going to pick you. Look at your brother's. God reaches in to the never, should have, never, could have pile. And he pulls out common people and he puts a power on them. And he does something uncommon with them. A lot of people don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit again because it's just an unknown variable. But, but the thing is, is you want to talk about God the Father and you want to talk about God the Son. 
But in all reality, when you're talking about God the Son, what was his primary purpose? To talk about salvation, to talk about how you ain't got to die and go to hell. Let me save you, and then let me give you this power. So his purpose on earth was to buy back people from sin, buy back people from death, and say, listen, not only am I going to save you, but then, I might, then, then, but then that uh, power is going to live inside of you. That was his purpose, and that was his mission, that was his goal. But So when people want to talk about Jesus, but not talk about the ultimate, I'm going to dis discipline you enough and get you to a point of proper management so you can handle the power that I put inside of you. We want to talk about God the Father, God the Son, but but all of a sudden we don't want to talk about the purpose of God the Son because when you begin to talk about Jesus, then you can't talk about Jesus without talking about the Holy Spirit because that's why he came. To, to get us ready to receive the Spirit of God when he, go, when he went back to heaven. You want to talk about God the Father, God the Son, but not talk about his purpose? He said, listen, the Holy Spirit will not live in dual occupancy. I'm not going to give him to you until you're ready. So I'm going to bear this cross so that my blood will free you from sin. And when you're free from sin, then the Holy Spirit can reside inside of you. The world will not see me, but you will. They can't because they're full of sin. got to get to a place. How many of you guys want more power? I'm just being serious. How many of you guys want more power? How many of you guys want more power? Some of you don't. That's fine. I'll take it. I'm going to move and shake, man. I'm doing something. I don't care. You come along with me if you want to. I'm going. I'm going. Why? It's not, listen, the, the flesh of Brad wants to go sit home in my lazy boy. But all of a sudden, there's a power inside of me. And every time I get behind a microphone, all I want to do is scream and holler about the power of God that resides inside of me. It's not a Brad thing. It's a power thing. It's a Holy Spirit thing. And it just so happens that he lives inside of me. Colin, I told this story earlier that just blesses my heart. Colin had a wrestling match yesterday. And Colin is a very talented wrestler. I don't know how far he'll ever take it. And we'll, we'll let him stop when he wants to stop. But this kid can go places. Um, and I know he's only seven. But I'm telling you, he's, he's just gifted. He's, he's, he's gifted. And um, yesterday he went to a tournament. And it was a different type of a tournament. It was a it was a points tournament where you don't you don't you go for four you don't go three rounds of a minute each. You go for four minutes total if you can. And you all it's all about racking up points. That's it. So you know you you, you spin behind them. That's a you know a couple points. You know you put them to the ground. That's a couple points. If you pin them, you get a point. You get four points, whatever. But it doesn't stop. You just keep on going. To, it's a points thing. And um, the first one he goes out there. And uh, I was, Chuck and Ashley were sitting down closer, and I was up in the, in the stands a little bit more. I, I really, I stay as far as I can away from um, the map because I lose it. <laughs> um, and uh, really, and it just, it helps me cope. But, uh, but uh, I was watching him, and I could even tell that Colin was not being Colin. He was super duper slow, no aggressiveness. Like, he was waiting for the kid to all, like he kept on doing the same thing over and over again. And he got beat. He got beat. And, uh, and I was thinking, I don't even get that. I mean, like, listen, we'll, it's okay to lose. We don't care about you losing. As long as you go out there and you give your best, whatever the outcome is, it's the outcome. We're, we care more about you being developed and disciplined. So he goes over to Ashley. He goes over to Ashley, and he takes off his, he takes off his headgear, and he, and he kind of chucks it out her, and he says, you said it was going to be easy. And she said, I never said it was going to be easy. Yes, you did. You said it was going to be an easy match. And she said, but no, I didn't. But even if I said it was going to be easy, you just thought you can go smash on some Doritos and Pepsi, which I don't know where you got it from, and go eat some pop and popcorn and go out there and just, he's going to roll over and you're going to win? I mean, you, what? So I go down there. After they have that conversation, I go down there, and he's, you, you can tell he's mad. He's mad. Colin doesn't care about winning. Colin just wants medals and trophies. That's all it is. Am I going to get first place? Probably not, son. Am I going to get second? Probably. Hopefully. Depends if you're going to change your behavior. So I said, come up. And he sits on my lap. And I said, explain to me. I don't care that you lost. But that wasn't the same calling that I saw last week. Where's the power? Where's the confidence? Where is it? He said, well, mom said it was going to be easy. 
So because all of a sudden life said it was going to be easy, you're just going to just hope that it rolls over and plays dead and you can win? I said, it doesn't work that way. I said, listen, listen, sometimes you got to lose to figure out how to win. And son, if you go out there on the second match and do the same thing that you did the first match, listen to my words, hear what I'm saying, Colin, you're going to lose. Sometimes you got to lose to figure out what it takes to win. But, my boy, if you go out there and you operate with power, operate with authority, operate with some swag and some confidence, I promise of God, the outcome is going to be different. And he goes out there, and for match number two and match number three, he beats them ten points to zero. And I, he came back, and I said, so, and they, they raised his hands. He's trying not to smile because he's realized Mommy and Daddy was right. He's like, like, whatever. He comes back, and I said, so what was the difference? And he said, I was stronger. He said, I was faster. There's a power that's inside of you that hell doesn't know how to mess with. Hell is showing up hoping that you're not activating that power inside of you. Yeah, I thought it was going to be easy. Why, why are you back down here? Now, listen, devil, listen. I, I tried. I tried to go attack Brad, but you said it was going to be easy. No, it's not going to be easy. That dude, the Holy Spirit is inside of him, and he's getting to a place of discipline. He's getting a place of management, and he's even more powerful today than he was yesterday, and that holds true for you today. Let the devil show up at your doorstep waiting to take you hostage, and then he shows up and he says, wait, I thought you were going to be easier. And you say, no, 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 but what you got to understand, Mr. Devil Guy, as I've been going to this church, and he's been talking about discipline, and he's been talking about management, and I know that there's a spirit inside of me, and I'm getting to a place of discipline and proper management, so that will grow, and I can become more powerful. No, so I'm not going to be easy today. Why? Because there is a spirit. You know that Jesus? I know you know that Jesus. You talk about how you know that Jesus. That same spirit that rested on him is now on me. God, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for the power. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the season that we're in. A season of discipleship. A season of training. A season of management. Although sometimes it's uncomfortable, we know that that has to happen in order for us to access more power. So thank you. Every week I give you an opportunity to accept the Lord as your Savior. You heard my message for the last 35, 40 minutes. And if you're saying that that is me, Brad, that's me, I, I, I want more power. There's sin in my life. I got to get that sin out of me. I want more power. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand as, as an act of faith. And I want you to repeat these words after me. Jesus, I need more power. Please come into my heart and cleanse me of my sin. And fill me with the Holy Ghost so that I have power, confidence, and authority. Authority to speak in tongues. Authority to set forth matters in my life. Save me in Jesus' name. I now profess you as my Lord and personal Savior. Amen. Clap your hands. Celebrate. We love you. We'll see you guys next week. One service next week, 11 o'clock. One service next week, 11 o'clock. I would imagine that you need to get here a little bit earlier. We should have a good crowd. Oh, oh, Sean, hold on for a second. Um, next week, we are going to have security here. Uh, and it will be an armed police officer. Uh, because it's just important to know, we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of people here, hopefully. And we'll have a lot of uh, visitors here. And not only do I want the visitors to feel welcome and feel safe, I want you guys to feel welcome and feel safe. And uh, getting to a place of proper security is something that's been very mindful of us. We have proper security now. But I just thought for that day, we'll kind of gear it up a little bit. So when you show up and you see a, a police officer walking around, nobody's in trouble, uh, I think. Uh, but, uh, but he's here for our protection so we can enjoy our service. So I just thought you guys should know about that. We love you. We will see you next week. Adios.